This video comes with a content warning for mention of abortion and homophobia. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome all. This is the third installment in a mini-series in which I'm responding to Jubilee's middle ground video, Liberal Christians vs. Conservative Christians. In the previous episodes, I examined the debate around Christian values and politics, the biblical position on abortion, and biblical teachings on sexuality and marriage. In this episode, we turn to the more meta-theoretic questions of hermeneutics and scriptural interpretation. There is a section of the debate where they ask whether Jesus would march with Black Lives Matter, but both sides more or less agree on this point, and I tend to agree with them, so I won't address it in this series. Without further ado, let's follow the prompt. The other side misrepresents Christianity. The other side misrepresents Christianity. I feel misrepresented in that um, I often say that the evangelical or conservative church has built an idol to sexual purity and sexual integrity, which is why the gay issue is so high on the agenda and the pro-choice, pro-life issue. The Bible is not a sex manual, but so often I see it being presented as like the utmost issue. And what we're talking about earlier about social justice and all of these other beautiful things that I believe Jesus would be a part of, you know, Jesus himself was not harping on people's sexuality constantly. As always, Brenda expresses this point excellently. Even if you ignore all biblical and historical evidence against the view that the Bible prohibits gay relationships, you still have to recognize that homosexuality is mentioned at most five or six times in scripture in the most conservative readings, while commandments to give to the poor, preach the gospel, and fight against the systems of injustice in society are in almost every book of the Bible. The simple truth is that the conservative fixation on quote-unquote key issues has caused them to lose all focus on the gospel in favour of spouting homophobic and transphobic false doctrine at every opportunity. I think a lot of people turn to the progressive side because they're hurt by the church and what the church did to them and how the church treated them. It's showing people come as you are and stay as you are instead of come as you are and let God change you and let God work in you to not live the way you were before but to change and have a new life and become a new creation and join me in heaven. No, it isn't. At least, as far as I am a representative of one kind of leftist progressive Christianity, I strongly believe in the biblical truths of repentance, salvation, and sanctification. Faith that doesn't result in a change of behavior is not a faith that brings salvation. As the epistle of James, chapter 3, verses 18 to 19 teaches us, Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that, and shudder. Where we disagree is what the acts and deeds which mark a saving grace are. The conservative believes that a saving grace is marked by hatred, oppression, homophobia, and by protecting social systems of oppression in the name of quote-unquote purity. I, instead, believe the Bible. What we read in the same chapter of James, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Or, as it is written in the prophecy of Micah, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Brenda puts this perfectly when she says, We love and honor the Bible too. We really do. I read my Bible every single day, and I think that is the thing that most conservatives don't understand about progressives more than anything. It's not come as you are and stay as you are, as Kiara put it. It's come, repent of your selfishness, your pride, your participation in systems of exploitation. Be saved through the free gift of grace at the cross. In response to that salvation and through the work of the Holy Spirit within you, be sanctified. Let your sanctification be seen through acts of justice and righteousness, a fire of righteous anger within your heart at the brokenness of society demonstrated through exploitation and oppression. Be driven by a love of God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, never resting till you have played your part in realizing the kingdom of God in this life and awaiting the day when Christ returns and makes all things new for the next. When I, when I pastor my church and they're having a hard time understanding the scriptures, I'm gentle with them because they're trying to learn. But I feel I could be harsh with progressive Christians because 
if they if you claim to be a Christian you should know better and I believe especially after this talk you don't know how to interpret the word you are dishonoring God because you are not doing his will now I firmly believe that because saying the word of God is not absolute or sovereign you're saying and you're picking and choosing based on your interpretations I think your hermeneutics is off see the, my church members are trying to learn but it seems like you already have an agenda and you're trying to fit the Bible into that agenda. All right then, pastor, let's talk hermeneutics. In broad terms, there are two ways to approach scripture, the literalist and the interpretative. The literalist approach holds that every word written in scripture, either the original Greek and Hebrew or in some particular translation, is prescribed exactly by God and must be read literally. The interpretative method instead holds that due to issues of translation, cultural difference, historical context, and the nature of the literature involved, some or all of the Bible requires interpretation, so that the true meaning of a given passage is not achieved by just reading the words and determining what they mean from some dictionary, but by placing those words in context, the historical context of their writing, who wrote them and for what audience, the textual context of the chapters around them and scripture in general, the rhetorical context of the wider religious literature of the time, and the linguistic context of the differences between the original language and the language we are now reading the text in. Now there are conservatives who are literalists, and conservatives who are more interpretive in their hermeneutics. Let's deal with the former camp first. There are two strong arguments against literalist interpretations of scripture. The first argument is from incoherence, and the second is an argument from scripture itself. The first argument merely points out that if every passage is interpreted strictly literally, then the whole of scripture is contradictory and incoherent. Consider, for example, Galatians 3.28, which reads, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If this is interpreted literally, we must say that categories of Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, cannot be used in any Christian context, because they do not exist in Christ Jesus. However, many conservative notions depend upon these very concepts. For example, arguing for patriarchal families, or arguing against same-sex relations, depends on being able to assign the categories of male and female to particular individuals. If there is no male and female in Christ Jesus, how are we to determine which relationships are same sex and which are not? If every passage of scripture is taken literally, the resultant text is absurd. The second argument, however, is a biblical one, coming from Numbers chapter 12. In this chapter, Aaron and Miriam challenge Moses' authority over Israel, and in response to their challenge, God appears and proclaims, When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions, I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses, he is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly, and not in riddles. So God himself is saying that to every prophet save Moses alone, God speaks in riddles and dreams, not clearly. Now, if the word of God is spoken to every prophet, indeed, the word of God to everyone save Moses alone, is to be taken as riddles, then we conclude that all of scripture, save the Mosaic books, must be subject to interpretation, because God himself calls these texts riddles, and riddles are not intended to be read literally. Thus, we can reject the literalist hermeneutics and must recognise that all of scripture is subject to interpretation. Once literalism has been laid to rest, it seems to me that there is no substantive difference in the hermeneutic frame that someone like me or Brenda would bring to scripture as opposed to someone like Jason, at least as far as I can tell from this debate. Both sides want to take the biblical text seriously, but we want to do so in a way which considers historical, authorial, textual, scriptural, rhetorical, and linguistic context. It is true that there are more radical liberal hermeneutics, those who would see all of scripture as analogy and metaphor, but I disagree with them nearly as much as I disagree with Jason, and none of the progressives in this clip seem to even flirt with that kind of approach, so if that was the accusation Jason was trying to level, it's an ill-founded one. If our base principles of hermeneutics are more or less the same, I can only conclude that Jason's accusation was intended as an elaboration of the preceding statement, that progressives pick and choose because of their own interpretation. The hermeneutic cycle is usually understood as a balance of moving between analysis, examining the parts of a text, and synthesis, placing those parts within the wider whole. So I can only assume this accusation of picking and choosing hermeneutics is a claim that progressives failed to synthesize their interpretation of certain verses into the scriptural narrative as a whole. I would argue, however, that not only is this accusation unfounded, but that conservative hermeneutics require much more picking and choosing than progressive ones. A very simple example of this appeared in my first video in this series, when discussing biblical views on abortion. As I noted then, the only biblical passage where abortion is mentioned explicitly is Numbers chapter 5 verse 27, which reads, 
If she has made herself impure and been unfaithful to her husband, this will be the result. When she is made to drink the water that brings a curse and causes bitter suffering, it will enter, her abdomen will swell, and her womb will miscarry, and she will become a curse. In short, the only biblical passage which mentions abortion explicitly commands that abortions be performed in certain circumstances. Nowhere in this text is this painted as a special exception. Rather, this passage clearly assumes that abortions are a reasonable and expected method for dealing with pregnancies when bringing those pregnancies to term would be undesirable, particularly if that undesirability comes from an infraction of the law. Once we recognise this passage and return to the synthesis of the whole scriptural narrative regarding pregnancy and abortion, it becomes clear that those passages which form the basis of the conservative argument against abortion, such as Psalm 139 verse 16, relate only to God's care for his creation and to the laying of plans for those who he has determined shall come to term. The pro-birth interpretation requires ignoring other parts of scripture. It is the epitome of picking and choosing. Or consider the conservative teaching on embracing traditional gender roles. Often conservatives will point to Genesis 3 as evidence that gender roles are God-ordained, yet doing so ignores the wider scriptural narrative both before and after this verse. Before this verse, we see in Genesis 1 that when God creates humanity, he creates them male and female, and ascribes to both commandments of leadership and family. Likewise, when does the assignment of gender roles come in Genesis 3? It comes in the three curses after the fall, which mark the three products of sin. Separation from right relationship with one another, separation from right relationship with the land, and lastly, separation from God. Turning later in scripture, we come to Galatians 3.28, which states, Nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. From this passage, we know that distinctions between the genders is redeemed through the cross which can only mean that that distinction, as it existed in the world, was in some sense the product of sin. Putting these passages together, and contextualising them in the wider arc of scripture, that is, considering how the story of Deborah involves God stepping into strict gender hierarchies and upending them, or how Paul's teaching sees women as individuals with their own agency rather than property, as a society at the time would have done, a clear and plain narrative emerges. While variation in biological sex characteristics are created by God for the purpose of reproduction, gender, the social extrapolation of these characteristics into social roles and mores is a direct product of the corruption of human relationships by sin, and this corruption is it redeemed and abolished under the cross. Thus, any Christian who advocates for traditional gender roles, or rejects transgender identities, is rejecting the cross to embrace sin, for the enforcement of social gender roles is itself a product of sin. Or consider the conservative teachings on same-sex relationships. It is they who pick and choose by pointing to a handful of passages in Leviticus or Romans, yet they refuse to consider the wider arc of scripture demonstrated in the place of the eunuch in the kingdom of God. Given the lack of a modern notion of sexual orientation and gender identity, eunuchs are the closest thing to a gender or sexual minority in the ancient world, and what do we see in scripture regarding them? At first, they are excluded, banned from entering the assembly of the Lord in Deuteronomy 23 verse 1, because the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant was to be established by genetic inheritance and eunuchs, unable to have children, could not participate in that inheritance. Then, we see the prophecy of Isaiah 56, verses 4-5, which declared, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose what pleases me, and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. In this prophecy, we see a new declaration that under the new covenant, the gender and sexual minorities which were excluded by the old covenant are not only included and accepted, but affirmed and honoured. This prophecy has its fulfilment in Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 39, when it is a eunuch who is chosen to be among the first Gentile converts to Christianity and the missionary to the Ethiopian church, which remains the oldest church outside of Judea. Thus, the arc of scripture shows in the eunuch a transformation for gender and sexual minorities from exclusion to acceptance to affirmation and honour, and the same story applies to LGBTQ plus gender and sexual identities today. There are many more examples I could give, from how purity culture rejects the commandments of Jesus, to how conservative glorification of capitalism rejects the biblical message against the accumulation of wealth and the exploitation of the poor, to how the conservative deification of family stands in contrast to Jesus' commands to leave family for him. However, I hope that the examples I've given show the point at hand, that in many cases, upholding the conservative interpretation of scripture requires ignoring the wider narrative of scripture, and therefore it is the conservative interpretation that represents a failure of hermeneutics a focus on analysis of one or a few verses, but a lack of engagement with wider scripture and an unwillingness or inability to synthesize that analysis with scripture as a whole. This is not to say that progressives are never guilty of cherry picking. Indeed, I've often found myself as often in conflict with progressives who are defending their position badly with cherry-picked verses and poor theology, 
as in conflict with conservatives who are defending bad positions based on cherry picking and poor theology. But when we consider scripture seriously, the progressive positions are still defensible, even if the nature of the argument has changed, but the conservative ones are not. Jason accuses progressives of coming to scripture with an agenda. You're saying you're picking and choosing based on your interpretations. You already have an agenda, and you're trying to fit the Bible into that agenda. The simple truth is that conservatives are just as guilty of this. The only reason they do not realize it is because the agenda they bring agrees with their prior beliefs. Nobody reads scripture cover to cover before they've had some views and ideological commitments implanted in them by preachers, family, and society. Thus, biblical interpretation is subject to confirmation bias. It has been well established in psychological research that if people with different prior beliefs are shown the same piece of evidence, both sides will claim that the evidence supports the belief they already held. Thus, when someone who already holds conservative beliefs come to scripture, they see passages like Galatians 3.28 or Numbers 5.27, and they cannot integrate the idea that God rejects gender distinctions and affirms the right to abortion into their pre-existing worldview, so they either ignore those passages altogether, or interpret them as metaphorical or analogical, or unapplicable to the modern Christian. Pretending that only the other side comes with an agenda is foolish and unproductive. We each come to scripture with our own biases. The question is, do we adapt our view in light of what we find in scripture, appropriately interpreted? My experience has always been that when progressives are presented with a scriptural passage, once they've examined its context and interpretation, they will do their best to synthesize that passage into their wider understanding of scripture and change their theology as a result. But I have never, in all my life, known a conservative change their stance when presented with clear biblical evidence against it. So if I were putting bets on which group values their preconceived ideology more than scripture, it would definitely be the latter. This part is already running long, so I'm going to put a break here and discuss the second half of the debate on biblical interpretation in the next video. Till then, grace and peace.